Hello. So Jonathan asked me to talk about my views on how to publish layer-dependent fMRI papers. And I would like to talk about two dimensions of that. The first one is how do you take your manuscript and get it through peer review? And the second dimension is how do you convert anything that you're doing in your daily life as a layer fMRI researcher and convert it into something that you can then submit to a journal? One of the most often questions that I'm getting is, which journal should I submit my manuscript to? And I'm afraid I don't really have an answer for that because the entire landscape of layer fMRI journals is kind of evolving a lot. So whatever I say today might not be true in the next year or so. When you look at the history of all the 220 human layer dependent fMRI papers published so far, you do see there's a clear winner. It's NeuroImage or now Imaging Neuroscience. Namely, they published like the vast majority of layer for my papers and there was this golden age in 2015 to 17 or so where every month there was at least one layer for my human paper coming out in NeuroImage. However, I'm not sure if it's still completely our home journal as layer for my researchers, as you can see here on the statistics, where you do see that since 2017, the number of human layer for my papers is still in growing more and more and more increasing. However, the relative and absolute share, market share of neuroimage or now imaging neuroscience this seems to be decreasing uh, quite a bit. So in 2017 it was still two out of three papers published in neuroimage and now it's only one out of 15 papers coming from neuroimage. So many studies have kind of moved on to other maybe subdisciplines. So it, I would suggest that depending on the flavor of your layer for my manuscript, you might need to consider other journals too, not only a neuroimage by now. And other candidates might be for very exciting new neuroscience findings with a lot of impact to submit to progress in neurobiology or current biology, those kind of journals. If it's a very cool new idea that's smart um, with respect to sequences, then MRM is one of the most respected journals for that. And for example, if you have a cool new tool that you think might be very useful and serves the field and might be used a lot, there is this new journal kit on the blog Aperture that I'm involved in that you might also consider to, to submit your, your manuscript to. So on the Slack channel of this workshop, the faculty potential reviewers were asked what the kind of things are that they usually want to see when they review a layer-dependent fMRI paper. And I think there's one very specific overarching theme which can be nicely summarized by this sentence from Jonathan, namely, I quote, in general, reviewers need convincing of the quality of the data and the analysis, since there is the recognition that layer fMRI is hard. So they want to see immediate, intermediate steps in their analysis. And I think this is also reflected in the other two comments here. Namely, usually it's not enough to just show the group result at the end, but usually reviewers need convincing that the, the data acquisition works nice and the data analysis works nice. For example, when with respect to data acquisition, Saskia Bollmann gives extra bonus points to authors that share their data. Or she also sometimes considers that when you have very complicated high-level neuroscience task designs, that are kind of hard to get a good feeling about the underlying noise characteristic, it might be nice to kind of calibrate or validate that imaging setup and with a simple stimulus as a sanity check. And for Rook, uh, focusing here more on the analysis, might be better convinced as a reviewer that uh, the authors do a good job with respect to analysis if he sees a structural image plus the segmentation that is used for the layers. Another kind of theme of feedback that we have gotten there is from Rami Menon and Peter Banitini, um, who share kind of the frustration that there's not enough cool, exciting new neuroscience application happening. So Rami Menon here sees that there is this um, theme that reviewers think, enough with all this methodology, let's start doing something interesting. So if you just have a methods-focused layer for my paper, it's harder to get reviewers really excited about it, and you might end up with lower like enthusiasm scores from those reviewers. Similarly, Peter Banitini here says that there is this growing impatience with those in the field for layer fMRI to start producing novel cognitive neuroscience findings. It seems that in the field is still in this dom domain of developing methods. So it's still possible to um, publish methods papers. 
However, the bar is just raised a bit to get really reviewers enthusiastic about this. So next, I want to talk about my strategies as an author to get Leia FMRI papers published, which are very subjective and I want to say them only with respect to three disclaimers. So first, I need to disclaim that while I'm exposed to publishing Leia FMRI papers and I have published a lot um, as first author and co-author and I have been exposed to do Leia FMRI reviewing and just startling as a handling editor of, of Leia FMRI papers, I don't really have a, a good cheat sheet about it. I don't know. It might be coincident that it had worked for me and it might not work for you. Second is that any advice that I might tell you might be bad advice that just matched to my profile in the sense that I might just be privileged. For example, when you look at all the Leia FMRI papers published out there, you see that most of them come from semen scanners. So four out of five Leia FMRI papers in humans are from Siemens folks, meaning that maybe they just have it easier, right? Or similarly, when you look at geographic diversity, two out of three papers published in human layer dependent fMRI come from European researchers. They seem to have it easier. Um, and, um, even more alarming, maybe the gender imbalance that three out of four layer fMRI papers are, com are coming from male authors. So whatever worked for me, might be just coincidence because I check all those boxes and I'm just privileged. And my third disclaimer is that I'm kind of a method developer, so or perceived as one from a lot of layer from my neuroscience application people, even though I think there's a continuous spectrum of who is the method person or the application person. So for example, sequence developers are usually considered as the application people for hardware builders. Now, fMRI method developers like myself are seen as the application people for hardcore sequence developers like Benedict Poser. And then the neuroscientists and see me as the method developer and I see them as, as the application person. However, for the psychologists, maybe the neuroscientists are the, the methods people. So we are all somewhere along the spectrum. And, but still, I say everything that I say from the perspective of a methods developer. And when you look at all my papers, I think you always hit jackpot on my bingo here. So you know bingo? This is this gambling game where you need to hit as many fields as you can in this matrix and if you have a line you get uh, extra points. So let's go through a few of them maybe that make me unique or unconventional are for example that I rarely really follow the strict structure of how scientific publishing uh, might have been envisioned in the sense that um, usually papers are perceived as this kind of timeless entity that's published with a DOI and it's the ultimate timeless truth. It's never the same, this is the case for me. For me, usually a paper is one step further um, compared to last year and it's very similar to my last year's paper, almost always. The another thing is that for me, I very often try to kind of have an overarching theme in my paper. So very often I think that in the time-limited domain of researchers, not many people read papers carefully, so it's important to be extremely clear. And sometimes this means even prioritizing clarity over accuracy, which kind of makes me a bad researcher because we should, as researchers, be unbiased, absolutely honest and very accurate. So I try to balance this conflict of having scientific integrity, but also kind of selling your story by writing abstracts like this, where in the or in papers like this, where in the abstract I write conventional methods are bad. Here I developed a new method. It's the best method. In the introduction I write, well, actually there are pretty good approaches out there already. I think I can improve them a bit though. In the results I say, hey look, with this specific experimental setup that I deliberately chose, my method looks the best. In a discussion I write, oh, my method is based on assumptions and they are bad and you probably shouldn't use it and I hate your reviewer too. And in the conclusion I say, my method is the best. <laughs> so this way I kind of can be the enthusiastic researcher for the abstract and the conclusion while also still having scientific integrity for, for the middle part of the paper, which I think is important because science industry is hard and you need to have a certain frustration tolerance to not give up always after the first failed experiment. However, if you are emotionally invested enough and care enough to go through the, the negative results at the beginning to make it work, then you are emotionally engaged and not unbiased anymore. And I think most people solve this conflict like that. 
other things that I try to do in my papers is to not take it too seriously. I try to have fun and try to kind of be unprofessional to some degree, sometimes even. Here to paraphrase John Lennon, layer of my publishing is what happens while you're busy making other plans. So I have my other plans, but still I can kind of write a story around it in, in, to make it a layer for my paper. And very often we have this weird artificial structure of introduction, methods, results, discussion, conclusion, which just doesn't fit to how I seem to work. For example, when I have a cool method and good data, then I'm done, right? So my method is my result. I, so I kind of fake it into a story usually and then just do it because you have to do it. I see layer for my publishing as like paying your taxes. It's just something you have to do. It's certainly not fun. I don't structure my life around it. Like with taxes, I don't think about what I buy and what I sell or whatever. So it fits and benefits my tax return at the end of the year. It's the other way around. Just once a year, I sit down, think what have I done in the last year? And then I've kind of formatted it into this external weird artificial framework of a paper or of a tax return and then make a story around that retrospectively. And I just need to do it because otherwise I would face consequences later in life or my career. I think publishing is slow, it's unnecessarily slow and it's complicated. And I do get the concept that we need to publish to communicate our results. And I do get the concept, con and I understand why we pay taxes, but still I, I can imagine much more efficient ways to do that. And ultimately it's still unfair. It's based on kind of reviews and trust and, and which is not the ultimate truth, the science at the end. Let's go through a few more points in this bingo over here. And um, maybe one common misconception that I see sometimes is that layer fMRI can be published um, if you don't have a lot of data, because very often you don't have as much ends, as many participants as you do in other neuroscience application studies sometimes. And the misconception is that this does not mean that you have not a lot of data. In fact, very often in layer dependent fMRI, you have much more data than in other common standard conventional resolution fMRI study. Maybe the N is not the number of participants, but the N is the number of runs, of trials, of kind of voxels per ROI. Usually you need to have a lot, a lot of data to publish in layer dependent fMRI. And then depending on what reviewers find, um, acceptable in the respective fields, you can get away with even five participants if you have a lot of good convincing data for them and get your layer from my paper published. But for kind of some neuroscience application studies where the biggest source of variance is the inter individual differences, then common reviewers actually do ask that you have double digit or like 20 and more um, subjects. To give you some reference, I published two papers this year. One has a subject N of one but many, many, many days and sessions. And then the, the second paper that I published has an N of about 30. So, but both of them have about the same amount of time spent at a scanner. Uh, the second thing is um, I usually try or I enjoy also as a reviewer when people do not hide information, have information on many figures and sometimes they are a bit kind of overloaded, but I have figures with many, many panels. Specifically, when you do have only small number of participants, then it is kind of common in layer dependent fMRI to show individual results. It's normal that they look ugly and you can just show this ugliness, but usually I think it's more common in layer fMRI than in other disciplines to show individual subjects. And one thing that I consider always when I'm self a reviewer, I, as a first question, maybe when I look at layer profiles, I do think, can this effect be explained just by wanes? Are these two task conditions just scaled versions from each other? Is it just a training wane effect or a, a gain effect that the different vascular reactivity across different layers can explain all the different task modulations? Um, maybe one thing that's a bit annoying, but it, it's necessary is that I have a, a, usually a footnote about what I mean with layers. You can choose anything that you like. You just need to define it, what you mean by layers. Some people think that layers is deceptive because you're referring to the Broadman layers or the, I don't know, whoever neuroscientist defined their layers. Uh, some people say, think that the Latin word for layers, laminae, is, is better or cortical depth or whatever. 
just define what layers are. Now, the second dimension of layer for my publishing is I'm doing a study and how do I get it into a form of a paper? And let's look at this scenario here, which is really a painful scenario that I experienced firsthand and then secondhand is that you will have a cool, new, ambitious idea to do layer fMRI with a neuroscience context, for example. And then you start it, and then it's hard, and it's hard, and month after month, and you tweak it and optimize it, and after a year, you sit down and you realize, well, I'm not going to have any data of my study design that I can publish now. So what I suggest in this context, or what I always do, is then just publish whatever I did. I sit down once a year, and write a report of what I did in that year and surely I learned something and if it's just about artifacts then it's a paper about artifacts but I've just published it's just something you do and let me explain this with with an example so in 2012 I was inspired by using Gönse to see um, task modulations in layer fMRI in monkeys and I wanted to get it work in humans and then I started it and I didn't start it because uh, it was easy, but because I thought it was easy. And then I struggled and I struggled. And everything that I looked at looked like veins and I couldn't trust it. And then I struggled about the readout and, and used VASO. And I, even though the paper might be written as a kind of sequence comparison, it was not. And I didn't use VASO because I like noise. It was just because I struggled. And then I struggled about the readouts 2D and 3D and how to get good sampling. And then I had good data and I struggled with the analysis. And only like year after year after year, I finally got it to work to see the simple thing of just task modulations across layers. However, these five years that it took from beginning to publication is not the time scale how your employer gives you contracts, or it's not the time scale how grant works, or the, the time scale of what supervisors find acceptable to not publish anything. So I just had to publish, and I just published whatever I did. So don't think that when I say just receive papers as a report that you shouldn't have goals. You need to have goals. But those goals sometimes are longer than the publication periods that, that are accepted, expected from us. And another example is that like since five years almost, I'm, I'm really trying to do kind of more interesting neuroscience to, to map the entire connectome of, of cortical and subcortical connections. And then I started and it's hard. And I struggled about the acceleration. I struggled about the readout. I, I struggled about field strength. And, and all the stuff that I showed you on Monday about deep brain structure is I didn't show you that because I think you like hard areas, but it's because there is this long term goal and I need to publish on this every single step to get there ultimately. And with this, I thank you for your attention.